if I can, I just want to pray us in to this moment. Um, thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you for this uh, table event, this table talk. I'm super excited to be uh, leading this conversation um, pertaining to the life of the believer. Um, I pray that just great conversation comes out of this and we're edified by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So um, I've uh, been doing this. This is probably, I don't even know, I've lost count, maybe my seventh um, table talk or table event. Um, in all of these, I do them every Wednesday, every Wednesday at, um, well, it's 12 for me. I don't know what time it is for you guys, <laughs> but um, it's 12 for me, Eastern Standard Time, um, 12 to 1. So um, you can be a part of this every single Wednesday if you would like to. Um, so just wanted to say that 6 p.m. in Germany. Wow. Y'all are awesome. Um, so uh, I wanted to just have a conversation pertaining to the life of the believer and um, basically to start off this conversation or where this conversation will be kind of centered around is Jude, um, Jude chapter one. There's only one chapter in Jude. But um, I guess you can say the book of Jude. Um, this conversation will be centered around. Um, so if any of you guys are not familiar with Jude, um, Jude is the um, last chapter before the book of Revelation. Um, Jude um, was actually a brother to Jesus, one of Jesus' half-brothers. And it's important to um, note that Jesus's brothers, they didn't become disciples um, or followers until after the resurrection, um, until after Jesus resurrected. That's when they became disciples and they would later become leaders and missionaries in the first Jewish Christian communities um, as the church began to expand. And so Jude writes this letter to a church, and it doesn't say specifically um, what church that he um, was writing this letter to, but we would assume that um, this church was made up of mostly Messianic Jews. And the reason we would uh, believe this is because his writing style assumes a deep knowledge of the Hebrew Bible and other Jewish literature. So he basically goes on and he writes this letter and um, he becomes aware of this crisis in the church. And so this helps us kind of understand the design of the letter. Um, if you want to kind of take notes of this, um, the design of the letter or the structure of the letter, it starts off with an opening charge. And that's from verses one through four. And then it's followed by a long warning and accusation against corrupt teachers who had influenced this church. And that goes on from verses 5 to 19. Then, Jewish, um, then Jude closes by completing the charge about what the church is supposed to do. Um, and so if you guys have your Bibles, you can kind of follow along with me. But in this book, um, he says in verse three, he says, beloved, while I was very dil diligent to write to you concerning our common faith, I found it necessary to write you to exhorting, um, to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. So what is he saying here? He's basically saying that this letter that he writes to the church wasn't supposed to be written. Originally, what he had in mind was to write a letter um, concerning their common salvation. So um, just to write to them talking about, you know, um, we all have the same salvation. We all have the same faith in Christ Jesus. And he was going to write about that common salvation um, and how really Jesus brings us all together under this um, unity umbrella of salvation. And so he switched gears because he found it necessary to write them concerning um, contending for the faith. And basically the reason why he switches gears and the reason why he writes this and talks about this, he says it in verse four, he says, for certain men have crept in unnoticed 
who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So the reason he switched gears and he switched um, basically the theme or, or, or subject matter of this letter is because he was made aware that there are certain men who've crept into the church and basically they've come and they've turned to the grace of God into lewdness. The word lewdness, what it means is practicing sin without shame. So these certain men who have come in to the church, who've crept into the church unnoticed, and, and it's important to kind of highlight that word unnoticed because it's showcasing that these men have they, they didn't come into the church with these with these signs on their shirt, you know, or 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 something, you know, tatted on their forehead that says we're ungodly men. So for them to come in unnoticed, they probably walk the walk and they talk the talk. You know what I'm saying? Like they 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 probably seem the part. They probably like if if you looked at, at them you know, from the outer appearance, they look like good Christian wholesome men. And so they crept in unnoticed. People didn't notice that these were ungodly men. People didn't notice that these were false teachers, but they were. And Jude is made aware of this. And so he says that these men, they've crept in, they've turned the grace of God into lewdness. So basically they turn this grace that God has given us. What is this grace that God has given us? This unmerited favor. That's what grace mean, uh, means. And what is that unmerited favor? It's salvation. We don't deserve to be saved, but we are saved by grace. We don't deserve it through faith, through believing in him. We have an opportunity unto, we don't deserve it, but he gives it to us anyways. So they've taken this grace that's given to us that truly we don't deserve and they've twisted it, they've manipulated it and they've perverted it. They've perverted it to mean lewdness. What is lewdness? Practicing sin without shame. So basically what they've come in to do is say, hey, because you have the spirit of God on the inside of you, hey, because you are saved, you can now do whatever you want to do and it's fine because you have the spirit of God on the inside of you, because God is with you. And so they've perverted this concept they've, uh, of grace. They've perverted this concept of salvation to mean something that it really doesn't mean. And so basically Jude goes on and from basically verses five through um, 19, he goes on and to talk about these ungodly men um, basically to showcase that these ungodly men have been around since the beginning. You know, he, he, he quotes uh, many Old Testament stories. He talks about um, leaders who have led others um, astray. And he talks about leaders who receive um, divine, um, divine justice, meaning that they were condemned or um, they received a consequence for their lack of faith, for their falling away, for their resisting God, um, yada, 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 you name it. So he goes on a long list of talking about these ungodly men, these false teachers that's crept into the church, giving context to them, giving context to um, really the scheme of the enemy and, and how um, these un like the enemy has been using these ungodly men like for centuries, for years and years and years. And he quotes a many on um he quotes many Old Testament stories to showcase this point, to really drive this point home. Then on verse 20, he picks up what he originally um the idea he originally started with about contending for the faith. And then he 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 goes on in verse 20, he says, but you, beloved, so he goes on, he talks about these ungodly men and he makes a distinction from these ungodly men to God's people, to God's children. He says, but you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, 
praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto, unto eternal life, and have and on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. And so this is where I'm going to kind of like pause and take some time on um, this section here, verses 20 through 23. So he goes on, he talks um, um, about the true believer, and he says that they must build themselves up in their most holy faith. So um, he's creating this imagery with talking about building yourself up because as um, New Testament believers, we are the temple of God. We learned this, that now um, um, God's spirit, God's presence doesn't just reside in his temple, but he has made himself um, um, a temple being the body of Christ, being us as individuals. He's made himself a temple to dwell. So what does that mean? That the spirit of God now dwells not in the temple, but his people, because we are the temple of God. That's why we have to um, 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 be careful how we treat our bodies, because our bodies is the temple of God. So um, he's made us his dwelling. He's made, he's put his dwelling, his spirit on the inside of us. Now, um, he says, build yourself up. So now, um, if you read in the Old Testament, there is, there is very specific ways in which they have to build the temple. Um, God gives them every inch, you know, in, in which things need to be built in, um, how long things need to be, how wide things need to be, the material that, um, that is needed to be used. God is very, 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 very specific when it came to building the temple because it had to be just right because his spirit would be dwelling in the temple. So he gave them very, very, very specific instructions when it came to, um, yes, exactly, um, in Exodus. He instructs Moses in how he wants the temple to be built. So with this same idea, Jude is now presenting it in kind of a different fashion um, in the New Testament in this book. There is a building up of his temple, but it isn't physically, it's spiritually. So in this building, he says this, he says, build yourself up in your most holy faith. So at the foundation of the, the, this, this temple, which is us, must be faith, must be our faith in Jesus Christ, our faith in the gospel. Um, because it is the gospel that saves, the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves us. So at the foundation of this temple, which we are, us, must be the truth of the gospel that we have put our faith in, okay? Build yourself up on, this is what we're building up our, ourselves on, so it's at the foundation, your most holy faith. So in the life of the believer, one thing that should never change, one thing that they should be rooted on, one thing that they should be standing on is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is a non-negotiable, that is some, something that is unchanging. We may all have different beliefs when it, when it comes to maybe speaking in tongues or prophecy and all of those different things. Cool, I think there's room for that in the body of Christ. But one thing that is a non-negotiable, one thing that we must all um, be firm on, be rooted on, something that is unchanging, is the gospel of Jesus Christ. As the believer, you must be rooted and founded on this, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Now, he goes on. Um, then to talk about praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, in the life of the believer, um, yes, our foundation, gospel of Jesus Christ, 
Now, in, in the other parts of this building that we are, if you want to say maybe the walls, this is what they're made up of. It says praying in the Holy Spirit. Now, in the life of the believer, we should never, ever in our, in our lives forsake prayer. Prayer is something that is so, 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 so important in the life of the believer. And in speaking of prayer, it says praying in the Holy Spirit. So we believe as believers that when we come into a moment of prayer, it's not simply just us kind of expressing thoughts that come to our head, but we genuinely believe that we are led by the Holy Spirit in praying to God, that the Holy Spirit leads us into moments, brings things to our minds, brings things to our remembrance when we are in prayer to our God. So praying in the Holy Spirit for the believer um, to contend for the faith, to keep the faith, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to um, be you maintaining faith in the gospel and maintaining a life of prayer. So remember those two things. In verse 21, it says, keeping yourself in the love of God. Now, um, Jesus explains um, the love of God expressed through the believer. Um, Jesus says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So in an expression of love to God, the way we express our love to God is through obedience. Now, this is exactly what he was saying, the, the false teachers that came in, what he spent so many verses on, okay, verses 5 all the way to 19. He spent so many verses talking about these false teachers um, that's crept into the church. This is exactly what they're coming against. This is exactly what they are, the, 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 the message that they are, are speaking, are preaching is, is, is contrary to this, is contrary to obedience. Their message is, God loves you, live your life, be happy, do whatever you want. That's, that's the message that these false teachers are presenting. And quite frankly, that's the message that our world presents to us today. If you turn on the TV, I'm sure, you watch a movie, you watch a show, you watch a commercial, the message that is being portrayed is follow your heart, do whatever makes you happy, do whatever you want. And, and with this message, at the root of this message is really, if we come down to it, that we have the potential to be our own God. That to follow a God or the, or the instructions of a God or the ordinance of a God is very much so outdated. That is a very outdated way to live. That is a very outdated perspective to have. This new progressive thought process is we can be our own God. So in that vein, do whatever you want. Do whatever makes you happy. Live your life however you choose to live your life. Now, with this comes completely against the message that not only Jesus taught, but all of the um, apostles taught after him. That in our expression of love to God, in our expression of true salvation, in our expression of true Christendom, it will be expressed by our obedience to God's word. Now, does that mean legalism? No, that doesn't mean legalism. That doesn't mean I'm saved um, or, or, or my, my salvation or my um, good standing with God is, is based off of 
um, how well I can do everything he told me to do. No, that's not what I'm saying. Um, and 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 there are a group of people out there, you know, that are are very uh, much so live life in this in this this vein of legalism. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying here, because we believe that we don't even deserve salvation, so so there, so we weren't even good enough, quote unquote, to deserve to be saved. So that's not that's that's not it. Um, what I am saying though is, in the life of the believer, there should never come a point where you do away with the word of God and you say, "I'm just going to do whatever I want to do," because that does not express one true trust in God that what he the life that and the life and standard that he calls us to live um is truly good for us so that so one it doesn't express a true trust in God because even we we go all the way to the beginning Adam and Eve the serpent um um manipulating Eve um did did God really say that you can't eat of of the of the of the tree or does he just know that once you eat of it you'll be wise like him and you'll have the knowledge that he has so so he presented this idea to eve that that actually god is just withholding something that is actually good and so he presented this idea, not, he didn't present this idea, you know, Eve, bow down and worship me and serve me, yada, 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 yada. You know, that's, I think that's sometimes the idea that we are, are thinking, oh, that's the idea, you know, that the enemy is presenting to me. He wants me to bow down and serve him. The idea that the enemy wants to implant into your mind is God is withholding something that is good for me. And because he is withholding something that is good for me, I need to put it into my own hands to be my own God, to make my own decisions so that I can live life in a way that is good for me. Because what God wants isn't. Because God actually withholds good from me. That's the idea that the enemy wants to put into your mind. So that you can be your own God. That is the idea that he implanted into Eve's mind. And that's the idea that he's been implanting into humanity's mind since the beginning of time. So that you can be your own God. But when we choose to submit, to humble ourselves and come under the word of God, what we tell God is this, God, I trust that what you call me to do, the life that you have called, that you called me to have is actually what is best for me. It's actually the best thing for me. And it is the best life that I can live. The life that you call me to and the standard that you call me to live at. This is actually what's best for me. Now, again, the enemy is going to try to come in, pervert that, so that you don't believe that. But when we choose to follow his word, we are coming against that lie that the enemy wants to implant into our mind. And we are saying, God, I trust that you are good. God, I trust that you are good. So when Jude here, in Jude chapter one, verses 21, when he says, keep yourselves in the love of God, he's saying, keep yourselves obedient to his word, believing that he loves you and wants what is best for you. And the only way that we truly express that and show that is when we keep ourselves in his word. So keep, keep yourselves in the love of God. 
And then it says this. It says, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Now, what does this mean? What he's basically talking about and what many, many, many of the New Testament writers write about is the day that the Lord will come back and take his people. And there will be no more weeping. There will be no more mourning. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more tears. We will just be with him in rest and in peace. So looking forward to that day where the Lord takes us and is with us. Now, what I have to say about this, in the, in the New Testament, they believe, they genuinely believed that the return of Christ would happen in their lifetime. They believed that the return of Christ would happen in their lifetime. And because they believed that the return of Christ happens in their lifetime, a, a lot of times um, um, we, 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 we've created kind of this uh, vernacular, if you will, um, where we are looking for the, the, the um, last days. And so when you kind of look through scripture, there's kind of periods, there's moments and periods um, um, in which uh, God kind of establishes season or, or period um, in, in the life of the believer, in the life of the church. Now, we have been in the last days, the moment Jesus ascended. That has been the period that the church has been in. The next period for the church will be reigning with Christ, the millennial reign. But this period that we're in is the last days. We are in the last days. And the, and the early church believed that Jesus would return in their life time in their period in their lifespan and because they believed this there was um they, they they all wrote about they all wrote about um enduring to the end they all wrote, wrote about perseverance they all wrote about um taking joy in, in the trials and tribulations that you go through because the reward that we will um have when our Lord and Savior returns. So they all wrote about this idea about the reward that the believer experiences upon the return of Christ. And so because they all um, wrote about this, because they all believed this, there was this hope that they had um, to endure the persecution that they were going through. Um, they were being martyred. Um, they were being thrown into imprisonment. Um, they were being beaten. They were being mocked. There was so much that was happening to the believer in this time span as the church was expanding, as the gospel was expanding um, to different regions around the world. There was a lot of persecution that was happening to the early church. And the reason that they heard it so much is because they held on to this hope that Jesus is coming back. And when he comes back, I want to be found in him. I want to be found right with him. This is a concept that the modern church has lost. This is a concept that the modern church has lost. And because we have lost this concept in, within the modern church, we no longer have endurance to endure hardships, to endure persecution, to endure trouble, to endure trials. We no longer have this endurance. We no longer have this perseverance because our mind is totally focused on our here and now, and our mind no longer has any focus on our future and our future hope. You can do it. Read through the epistles. Read through 
read through the New Testament writers, they all spoke about the future hope that we have in Christ Jesus. All of them. They all wrote about it. But us as the modern church today, we no longer speak about it. And we no longer look towards it with hope. And because we no longer read about it, because we no longer talk about it, because we no longer look towards it with hope, it has taken away our endurance to endure hardship. We no longer endure hardship or know how to endure hardship because we've lost our hope in what is to come. And for the believer, Jude is saying here, there's, listen, we're, we're, we're out here, we're going to different regions, we're spreading the gospel, but we're coming against these false teachers. We're coming against these people that's coming in and they're wanting to manipulate the word. They're wanting to pervert the word. And what they're wanting to do is cause people to live within the means of their desires and their wants and whatever they want to do to just live that life. And because people are falling susceptible to this word and this lie and this doctrine, they're no longer focusing on the joy and reward that awaits us, but they're saying, how can I live my best life now? How can I be rich? How can I have mansions? How can I have cars? How can I have all of these wonderful things in life now? And because that has become the focus, we have lost focus on the joy that awaits us. And because we've lost focus on the joy that awaits us, we no longer endure hard times. And because we no longer endure hard times, what's happening in the church today is people are going through trials. They're going through tribulation. They're going through persecution. And what they're saying is, this is too hard. I don't want anything to do with this. And we are experiencing a generation of people walk away from the church. We're experiencing a generation of people walk away from the gospel. We're experiencing a generation of people walk away from God. Why? Because as a church, we stopped looking forward to what's, what awaits us. And we started looking to what we can get our hands on today. So corruption, manipulation, all of these things have entered the church and it's caused a generation of people to walk away. And so this is what Jude is saying that we have to fight for as believers. He goes on, he talks about these false teachers and what they're going to do and how they're going to come into the church and, 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 and their ideas and their plans and, 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 and how God is going to get them and how they're going to be condemned and all of these different things. But he says, but you, beloved, build yourself in your most holy faith. Let your foundation be the word of God. He says, praying in the Holy Spirit, never forsake prayer as the believer, keeping yourself in the love of God, be obedient to his word, looking for, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, looking forward to the joy that awaits us, looking forward to the return of Christ. This is what keeps the believer. This is what keeps the believer. It's standing on the gospel of Jesus. It's living a life of prayer. It's remaining obedient to his word. And it's looking forward to his return. This is the recipe for the believer. This is it. The recipe for the life of the believer, it's this right here. 
standing on the truth of the gospel, living a life of prayer, being obedient to his word, and awaiting his return. That's it. That's it. This is how we contend for the faith. This is how we ensure that the gospel isn't manipulated by false teachers. We maintain this recipe right here. And then he talks about discernment. He said, on some have compassion, making a distinction, but on others, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. What does this mean? It means that when we're going out and we're, 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 we're spreading this gospel, he says, we need to have discernment as believers. It's not kind of like a, a copy paste method. <laughs> We need to have discernment as believers how to speak to individuals. Because for some people, it's, it's going to be this compassionate, making this distinction. Hey, I love you. I, I want you to know the truth of the gospel. It's, it's, it's either you're for God or you're against him. It's, 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 it's either you have faith in Jesus or you don't. You, you make this distinction with compassion. But for some other people, you have to save them with some fear, with a little bit of fear. <laughs> this is pulling them out of the fire, okay? And, and for some people, the, 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 the compassionate distinction isn't going to work. For some people, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be letting them know the reality of hell. Letting them know the reality of hell so that they would say, Hey, I, I don't want to choose that. <laughs> and, he's, and he's saying it, it's you, 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 we're going to have to be able to know the distinction, have this discernment on how to speak to different individuals. But there's the spirit of God that resides on the inside of us that can lead us and to guide us into making those distinctions. So for the believer... You must continuously be led by the Spirit. For the believer, you must be continuously led by the Spirit. And so um, um, I'm going to speak more on, on, on different things um, pertaining to the life of the believer, but that's all that I have um, for you today. Um, I'd love for maybe just some input, maybe some questions. Um, that any of you guys may have. Um, there should be a little icon, um, like a hand icon. Um, you can just press that and I'll make you a speaker um, so that you guys can um, kind of just contribute uh, to this discussion. But yeah, um, and if there's anything um, that you guys would want to write in the chat, you guys can do that as well. Um, Um, hello, Willane. You just, um, press unmute and then we should be able to hear you. Okay, cool. Um, Cool. Um, yes. If yeah, if anyone else have any comments or questions or anything, you can write them in the chat. Um, you can put the hand emoji. Um, but again, um, thank you everyone just for joining and being a part. Um, I think that moments like these are so important because. Um, Everyone, even, even Jesus talks about false prophets that would arise. Um, all of the New Testament teachers, they, they, they write about this. They write about this concept of false teachers, false prophets that, that are going to rise up. Um, and so because, be, be, because we've been warned <laughs> all throughout the New Testament, we've, we're, we're warned um, of this, I think that as the believer, we have to do our due diligence to ensure that we are so um, 
we're so um, um, adhering to true doctrine and, and that we're standing on the truth of the gospel because if we do not do our due diligence to be teachers of, I mean, not teachers, students of the word, um, if, if we don't do our due diligence to be students of the word, um, then we open up ourselves to be susceptible um, to being led astray by false teachers um, that are rising up in our day, day and age, in our, in our generation. And so um, I think moments like these are so important. I think they're so vital to the body of Christ um, to just get together and, and encourage each other um, on what the word says, encourage each other um, on how to maintain on the, on the straight and narrow path um, and, and to not give the enemy any foot, foothold or footstool um, in, in our lives. So yeah um thank you guys just for joining and, and being a part of this this is awesome um again if there's any questions any comments um yeah you guys can put them in the chat i'm reading the chat um just awesome just uh um see you guys writing on there um Thank you for everyone who's this, this is blessed. That's awesome. Um, that's doctrine of eminence has been forgotten. So true. Yes, we don't endure as much <laughs> as those before. And it's so funny, I, I, would, I would think about that a lot. Um, um, I would be like, man, that's crazy. Like the things that the early church went through, because we think about like someone looking at us wrong, you know, in our workplace or like someone cutting us off. I don't know, you know, and we're just like, oh, you know, we're experiencing so much and we're just like, oh, I can't, this is too much. And you think about like what they did and it's just like, oh my gosh, we're like babies. Um, <laughs> um we're so weak compared to them it's wild it's crazy um um alice i see the question what would you advise in a moment of weakness except praying and repentance um what would i advise in a moment of weakness um except praying and repenting and repenting um hmm well i, I well, I'm, what i'm gonna guess is you're already doing that um, in a in a moment of weakness, so so I guess what you're saying, like in addition to praying and repenting, because I think that that should never be replaced. Um, you you can add, um, but I think that should never be replaced. I think that should always be um, at like the root of of our response in moments of weakness. Um, prayer and repentance, like that should be at the root always. Um, what you can add to that, I would say, is like reading, um, I would say reading the book of Psalms. Um, for me, it always comforted me to hear the, how can I say this? Um, to hear the, the very raw words of David. Um, and to know that like, man, like he had, he had like some really low moments. Um, I think I have some low moments. But then I like read the book of Psalms. And I'm like, nah, he had some low moments. Um, and and there's there's Psalms on repenting. There's Psalms on Thanksgiving. There's Psalms on on every, any subject really, <laughs> on all subjects really. And I think that it just helps the human heart um, to be able to relate and and to hear the words that someone else gives in their moments of weakness. Um, so yeah, I would I would say. Um, in addition to praying and repentance, um, read the book of Psalms. Read, read a chapter, sorry. Read a chapter in Psalms for sure. Um, yeah. Any other questions, comments? Oh, cool. Uh, let me see. 
Grant, how are you? What's it? Hey, what's up? Yeah, all good, man. Thanks for the message. Really enjoyed that. Um, refreshing to you about um, you emphasizing sound doctrine and discernment mm -hmm. and, you know, awaiting the Lord's coming, something yeah. that, that we tend to forget. Yeah. So, yeah, great stuff, man. Keep it up. Mm -hmm. Looking forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, um, I'm doing this um, every Wednesday. I um, said that earlier, doing this every Wednesday, and it's going to be at the same time, um, an hour each time. So, um, yes, thank you just for being a part. And, and again, like I said before, um, I think that this is just like needed in the body of Christ. I think we, should, we have to have more moments like these, more, mo more gatherings like these. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just super excited and happy that you guys, um, awesome. Yes. That makes me so happy. Um, but yes, um, if there is any other questions, please, uh, write them now. If not, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and pray. Um, if you guys have any prayer requests, I'd love to add them, um, into a moment of prayer. Um, whatever they are, um, yeah, just just write them in the chat, and I'll go ahead and just like pray over those um, requests if you guys have any. But um, but yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and and pray now. Um, thank you, Heavenly Father, for just this table event, this table talk, Lord. Um, thank you for everyone who's joined, everyone um, who is. Yeah, just they've just been a part, Lord God. I'm I'm thankful, Lord God, that um, we we've just been able to in, encourage each other and and, and just share um, thoughts pertaining to the life of the believer, Lord. I just pray that for each and every person here, each and every person represented here. Um, I pray, Lord God, that there would there would be this sense of perseverance. There would be this sense of endurance um, that awakens in each and every one of them, Lord God. Um, I don't know their lives. I don't know their hardships. Um, I don't know the, the things that they're going through, maybe even currently right now. Um, but I pray this. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would cause them to endure. I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would, that you would cause them, Lord God, to persevere, Lord Jesus. And as they persevere, as they endure, I just pray, Lord God, that um, they, would, they would see another side of you, Lord God. And they would see another side of your goodness. And they would see another side of your grace. And they would see another side of your peace, Lord Jesus. Um, and that as they're enduring, Lord God, they, they would just be um, so encompassed by you, Lord Jesus. And they would know the depths of your presence, Lord Jesus, um, and your goodness, Lord. So I just pray, Lord God, right now. I pray for Alice, Lord Jesus, praying for um, her mother. Um, um, I just pray, Lord Jesus, right now, may your hand just touch her and, and be upon her, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be with her. And I pray that she would feel your presence and she would feel your nearness. And she would know, Lord God, that um, whatever the request of her heart is, nothing is too big and nothing's too small. But you are the God of the impossible. And I pray, Lord Jesus, right now for um, Cheryl, pray for prayer for the salt community. I pray for the salt community and, and that um, this community will just continue to grow and be empowered and, and be encouraged, Lord God, and they would just see you do amazing things. I pray, Lord God, that your hand um, would be over each and every individual and um, that you would lead them into all that you have for them. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.